my name is Phil Thomas, I'm the director of London South East, lc.co.uk. Um, thank you all for coming to our inaugural event of 2020, um, the oil and gas investor briefing. Um, it's nice to see a few familiar faces and a few new ones as well. Um, these are starting to become a bit more regular and we've got a, a good programme of events throughout the year as well. Um, I'm not going to introduce all our speakers in detail, I'll leave that to the wonderful Ed who's stepped into the breach and will be hosting us this evening. Um, and I won't do the fire fire thing either. Uh, <laughs> I was like, I expect you'll do that as well. Um, it, the markets have been very odd uh, the last few months, as I expect you all are aware, those who do follow shares in the UK. Um, political landscape's been odd, uh, Brexit hasn't helped, and um, whichever way you voted, um, but things are now start starting to settle down. And we're uh, talking earlier, we're starting to see a bit more positivity in the markets and things are definitely picking up. Um, so it'd be very interesting to hear what our uh, speakers have to say this evening. Um, and with no more ado, I'll hand you over to Ed. Sorry. Good evening. Hi, my name's Ed Bauscher. I'm a financial journalist. Um, I've written for Motley Fool and Money Week and all sorts of other people worked at Share Radio as well. I've also been a private investor for 23 years uh, and I've invested in many oil stocks. I've had some big winners. I've had some big losers too. I, I expect uh, some of you have been in the same boat. We've got a great evening tonight. Um, we'll be starting off with Jeremy Asher from Tower Resources. Uh, he's the chairman there. They're a small cap oil explorer. Got some interesting assets off Namibia, South Africa and Cameroon. Uh, an interesting moment uh, in that company's history. So we'll hear more about that. Uh, then we'll hear from Elaine Reynolds. She's energy analyst at Edison Group. Um, she's got experience actually at the hard end of the oil industry working as a geologist. For the last 10 years, she's been at Edison working as an analyst. She I think is going to talk about several different interesting regions at the moment where we're seeing oil exploration. And then to get some variety at the end, we're moving away from oil and gas. We're going to hear from Keith Hiscox. He's the CEO at Hardman & Co. As you probably know, it's a small cap broker. They do a lot of research. They also help companies, advise companies, listed companies. And he's going to be telling us about the, their latest research on where small cap investors have put their money, on the fact that actually small cap investors, as a percentage, their stake of companies is actually rising at the moment, what that means for liquidity and other issues as well. Um, but let's kick off with Jeremy Asher from Tower Resources. Jeremy. Thank you, Ed. And uh, I should uh, first of all say some of you uh, have heard me present about Tower before uh, and some of you probably have not. So I'd like to reassure both groups firstly that I am going to uh, go through a corporate presentation and introduce you to the company and our assets and who we are. At the same time, I'm not going to go through all the same slides that I've been through in the past, uh, and I plan to dwell a little bit more on a couple of the slides to discuss the latest timing on the well that we're planning to drill and the process leading up to that, uh, and also to be able to just talk more generally about uh, the financing of it and answer questions as you may have them. So I hope that there'll be something for both old and new friends. Uh, in terms of uh, Tower and who we are, we're a name-listed uh, oil and gas company, and our uh, history was really as an exploration company. But uh, although we have exploration assets still, mainly as a result of those old days, uh, our real focus at the moment is an appraisal and development project in Cameroon. It's not a huge project. Uh, we have, uh, uh, on our block, we have 18 million barrels of P-mean recoverable contingent resources in uh, one of the structures that's already had a couple of discovery wells drilled in it. Uh, and we've got quite a lot of additional prospective resources on that same structure. But there's a lot more prospective resources on the block. And you have to start somewhere. And this is a manageable project for a company our size. We're planning for production of uh, <clears throat> order of magnitude 8,000 barrels a day in 2021, if all goes to plan. Um, the estimated chance of success on that from the third party uh, who produced our CPR is 80%. That's because there is reservoir risk, as there is with any reservoir, but this is not an exploration risk. Uh, as I said, that 
two discovery wells have already been drilled. Um, so we have a, a, a current uh, uh, appraisal well in process, uh, which will cost the order of magnitude 15 million or so. That's already part funded because we've already got a lot of long lead items uh, bought and we've done the well design, well planning, the environmental work, site survey and so on. Um, we're planning to farm out and we've got discussions that are now reasonably advanced and I'll talk a bit about that. Um, and the upside on this is substantial. Uh, the potential cash flow uh, from 8,000 barrels a day plus is over $100 million a year. That's before, of course, we farm out, so we'll give a chunk of that away. But assuming we do that, that'll also mean we won't be calling uh, on shareholders to fund the well. So uh, uh, that's basically our main focus at the moment, and it's the most important thing to us uh, because that's how we'll build cash flow and also build a base for further exploration and production, I hope, in Cameroon. Um, we do have some other licenses which I will talk about. Um, two quite interesting ones. Uh, South Africa, where we have a joint venture with New Age, and the block that we have, which New Age operates, is next door to Total's Brulpada Discovery blocks. And we also have some attractive blocks uh, under a license uh, in Namibia, in the Walvis Bay area, and uh, I'll talk to you a little about those, and we also have as a legacy from some earlier assets that we had, we have some royalty agreements in the SADR, but I'm not going to spend time on that because the SADR, for those who are familiar with it, is not a country yet. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about, um, and I'm going to talk mainly about Cameroon and Tali. The Tali block, uh, for anyone who's not familiar with uh, the Gulf of Guinea, is in Cameroon in the Gulf of Guinea. Cameroon is kind of in the corner between Nigeria and Equatorial Guinea. Um, and Cameroon is an oil producer itself. Um, uh, it, the production in Cameroon peaked, I would say, at around about 160,000 barrels a day more than a decade ago, but is now something more like half that. So it's... Uh, a, a country which has got some interesting projects at the moment. There's a big LNG project, uh, floating LNG in fact, which is led by um, uh, uh, Perenco. But with all the attention that's gone on gas, oil's been a bit neglected. Um, the, the important thing about this is simply that there is a lot of infrastructure already in place in Cameroon and it's a very well established oil province. Uh, and the, 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 I think that the interest level in the country is for more, supporting more oil production is very high. The government's very keen to see uh, the decline in oil production reversed, and I think quite rightly so. Um, and so that's meant that the government have been very supportive towards us which we've certainly appreciated. It also means that to the extent we want to use existing infrastructure to move oil out, um, there's plenty of it there. You can see on this uh, picture where our block is compared to the um, uh, uh, various uh, Perenco and Adax oil fields and the Masongo terminal, which is a joint venture between the various producers and uh, the state oil company. And if we choose to move our oil out through the Masongo terminal, we can do it and we would join that consortium to do it. Um, the uh, pipeline network is quite extensive as you see, but in the near term, this is not a long distance, uh, as you can probably see from the uh, scale of the, um, of the chart. We're talking just sort of tens, a few tens of kilometers uh, 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 to move over to the Masongo terminal here. Um, and we'll be planning to produce into a shuttle tanker, which can do that without our having to immediately rush off to build a pipeline connection. But in the long term, as you can see, there's no shortage of infrastructure, no shortage of knowledge. Um, and it is an area that is well known as a source of crude oil to the traders and so forth, and they have cargoes collecting oil at Masongo all the time. So uh, we're in a, a well-established zone. Um, the block that we took over 
uh, which was originally, um, I think Shell had it long before Total, and then Total included it in a package of assets that they sold off to Perenco. Um, the block uh, has a number of interesting structures on it. The one that we're focusing on at the moment is this Andronji structure, which is uh, an oil-bearing structure where Total drilled two wells, Andronji 1 and Andronji 2, um, and when they drilled the second well, they discovered that there was a fault block, a fault here, which separated this node of the structure from the rest. Um, but there's also a lot of other prospectivity because the uh, Disoni field was originally part of this block, and Total had also made discoveries here, and when Perenko took over the asset, what they did is they took the Disoni block, they didn't have a lot of time to decide because by the time they acquired the asset from Total, they were already at the very end of the exploration period for that license. So they had to make an immediate decision what to do. They decided to put Disoni into production, which they did, and it's a 25 million, 30 million barrel field. It uh, produces, I think it was around 12,000 barrels a day um, and it's been a very nice little learner for them. Um, and uh, as far as we can see, there's some substantial potential fault blocks which are potential extensions of Disoni that extend south into our block, but they haven't actually been drilled yet, so we're not sure what's there. Um, the one well that was drilled was this early shallow gas well which unfortunately didn't go deep enough to test the oil reservoirs. But we also know there's quite a lot of gas in various places around the block. And actually what we're trying to do at the moment is avoid the gas um, because there's a surplus of gas in the area. Um, down the road, there's a new age project. In fact, if I go back here and we look more broadly at uh, uh, what's going on in the area, um, there's a, a, a new age project um, to develop a 1TCF gas uh, reservoir with some condensate um, not too far away. And that level of, of gas volume is a nice volume to develop, but a bit on the low side. And whatever they do, when they put their hub together, we expect that they'll have excess demand for gas. And then we may be more interested in the potential gas resources on this block. But for now, we're just focused on oil. And what we have here is oil. There's a small gas cap here. There may be a small gas cap here, but the seismic, there's usually bright spots where, where the gas is. And we don't have bright spots. And the wells um, indicated, in particular on Anjanji 1, no gas cap at all. So we're aiming to simply produce the oil and doing so will be fairly simple in this area. Um, the uh, uh, best volumetric estimate we've got at the moment is 18 million barrels in this structure, in the upper reservoir mainly, and in the northern part of a lower reservoir. The lower reservoir doesn't, um, ex it extends all the way out even further. It's quite large to the south. But there's a fault across here, which is not sealing at the upper level, but seals at the lower level, we think. And therefore, we don't know for sure if this part is oil bearing or not. And we won't find out from this first well we're drilling, but we will find out from the next one. And if so, that would pretty much double the amount of um, uh, oil in the structure. Now. Um, what we're planning to do is the original wells that Total drilled, as I mentioned, were in these sort of northern sections. And what we plan to do is to drill our next well closer to the center of the structure, not completely at the center, because there's various micro faults we want to avoid. And we also want to avoid any gas cap if there is one. But we're going to go into a thicker area, um, both to uh, confirm what the seismic appears to be telling us, but above all, we want to do a flow test 
because Total, when they drilled their first two wells, they never did a flow test. So they logged them while drilling, and there's some samples from the well, which is why we know that the quality of the oil is higher quality than the uh, typical uh, cole and locale qualities. Um, but we don't know how the reservoirs will flow, and these reservoirs are not the same reservoirs as in Dasoni in the north. So it's important to us to do that flow test, and we can't book proven reserves, even though the discoveries are made and we know the reservoirs are there, until we have that flow test and we can see clearly that the oil moves. Now, there's always a possibility that there's something wrong and we won't have a good flow test. If the well doesn't flow, it'll be very unusual in the Rio del Rey. Um, but there is a risk and we know there's a risk and that's why it's so important to drill this well and why also uh, we can't book proven reserves until we've done so. When we've done that, our thinking is to drill three more wells from the same location, but extending in different directions. This well, which we would then uh, plug and return to complete when we drill the other three wells, would be both an appraisal well and a producer. Um, the other producers, this one would be vertical. The other ones would go deviated towards the north um, east, towards the north, into the other fault block here, and towards the south. And by doing that, we would be able to draw oil from all the other parts of the upper reservoir, and also we'll be able to test the lower reservoir in the south, so we'll find out whether that's oil bearing as well. And if so, with that second well that deviates to the south, we'll be able to immediately, I hope, add additional proven reserves. The, the idea then is that the four wells all will be extending out to different parts of the reservoir without our needing any additional subsurface uh, investment, but they'll all be coming up together to four conductors that will brace together with a simple steel structure, and that will allow us to have the four wellheads for the four wells all in the same place and above the surface, which will make it easy to bring a mobile oil production unit along next to that structure to produce. And the idea is that we'll then produce with the MOPU into a shuttle tanker, and then that shuttle tanker, if we go back to the earlier chart, that shuttle tanker can then take the oil over to the Masongo terminal, or indeed, frankly, we could deliver it directly to customers' tankers if they prefer. But um, we, the, the idea is to avoid having to do any pipelines, do anything that'll take a lot of time or involve substantial additional mob D mob for specialized vessels. Um, and by doing this, uh, we should be able to get into production rapidly. One of the neat things about Cameroon is that you can get temporary production authorization for um, up to two years without having to file a full field development plan and without having to hive off the producing part of the license into a separate production license. That's very important for two reasons. The first is it's simple and that means you can get to where you want to get to more quickly than if you had to go through the whole process of a field development plan. The second reason it's important is because the cost recovery pool from that temporary production is not ring-fenced. It goes together with your other exploration expenditures. And that means that we can continue to explore on other parts of the license while producing from Njonji. And not only can we get on with doing that all quite quickly and in parallel, but also it means that our recovery our, our, our costs of exploration while we're doing that extended well test on the temporary production authorization, it's, it's recoverable from the Njonji production. And with 8,000 barrels a day or more of production, you recover a lot of cost very quickly. So uh, the plan is 
to drill in John G3, um, probably in the uh, latter part, it was about in the third quarter, second quarter of this year, and we hope to complete it early in the third quarter. Um, and then we'll spend a few months doing two processes in parallel. One is getting the, all the requisite authorizations for the MOPU, and the other is um, specifying, mobilizing, and installing the MOPU. Um, will be, uh, they're naturally processes that occur in parallel because until you've got the well result, you don't want to commit to the MOPU, nor do you want to finalize the specification of it. And you can't get the last authorizations for the equipment import until you have a clear <coughs> description of the equipment that you're planning to import. So these things happen together. In theory, it can take as little as six months. In practice, we're assuming rather more. And we expect to get to first oil, hopefully in the second quarter of 2021. Um, and then we'll both begin production, but we'll also be doing additional drilling because we'll be, um, uh, uh, first of all, drilling the additional three wells uh, that we plan to put into production. But then, assuming everything's going to plan, we would also do some more exploration drilling on those um, other interesting fault blocks to the north, the cost of which we can also recover from the production. So that's the plan. Now, in terms of cash flow, uh, I thought about updating our cash flow forecast, but I decided not to because the basic assumptions haven't changed very much since the reserve report that Oilfield International produced for us um, uh, in 2018. What's changed is the schedule. And so I've explained the difference in the schedule and basically everything's been shunted out a year, um, maybe even a little more, but uh, everything's been shunted to the right. But the basic numbers haven't changed that much. Um, the Ford prices that uh, uh, were in place then are not that different from now. The market is slightly lower in the prompt than the Ford today, whereas uh, 18 months ago, it was higher in the prompt than the Ford. But the Ford prices then and now were a little under $60 a barrel. It hasn't actually changed that much since the time these uh, forecasts were prepared. And neither have the costs changed very much. So I think the best thing to do, because we're updating these numbers right now, is not to present our own numbers, but to stick with the numbers that have already been shown, but simply to point out to you that this is really... 2020, we're not going to get this full production in 2021, um, and this would be more like 2022. And uh, the picture that uh, uh, we had then, which was a total capital cost of $78 million or so, it's not very different now. Um, Tim Lines, when he did that number, had assumed a well cost of about 18 million, which is a little higher than the AFE we had, but he was making allowance for contingencies. And I still think that I'm fairly confident the well cost will come in between the 15 million that we originally es estimated and the 18 that Tim's got in there with his contingencies. And the same goes for the rest of the development, which would be 50 to 60 million dollars uh, for the three more wells, which will be cheaper than the first well because you don't need to test them and so forth, and for the steel structure and for the pre-operating expenses and so on. So that's our, um, uh, our, our, our likely outflow. And then we're expecting 100 million a year or so coming in um, uh, in cash flow from that pre-farm um, out, of course. We farm out, we'll only get uh, maybe a little more than half of that. Uh, but on the other hand, if we farm out, I expect that we won't have to put up very much of this money. Now, to be clear, I'm not expecting a farm out to pay for $78 million. But the thing is that what we've got to pay for at this point is the appraisal well. And the appraisal well, we've already paid for part of it. I mean, we've put at least three million of the cost into it already. 
Um, we're looking for 15 million for that well, and I think it's quite realistic to get that from a farm out, and we're in fairly advanced discussions about that at the moment. Um, once that's done, and bearing in mind that we've already put $10 million in before you even look at the well, um, provided we get the proven reserves we expect, we should be able to get revenue, uh, sorry, uh, reserve-based lending to cover the bulk of the rest of the phase one development, $50, $60 million, not unrealistic to get, provided we've already got that 25, maybe 30 million of equity underneath. So therefore, the key thing for us in terms of equity financing is this appraisal well. It's the last of the risk money. And uh, my view has been we've financed part of this from shareholders, but I really want to try to not take it all from shareholders. And we've had a, a, a process going for some months uh, to bring in partners instead to farm in. Now, doing that's been interrupted as a process because we had to get our license extension finalized. And that effectively meant that we had to put some discussions on hold for two or three months um, until we had the, even though we'd been told we'd be given the extension, we were waiting for the document and the document only arrived in January. Since then, those farm out discussions have picked up pace and I'm now very confident that we'll get that done in the not too distant future, which is why we're planning now already for the well spud and getting back to you know brass tacks we've done the site survey already um, and that's the next step that takes us to uh, finalizing the, the the rig so anyway that's the story on thali i won't talk about um, uh, south africa or namibia unless you particularly want to you ask me questions if you'd like um, nor the team, because most of you know this already. Uh, the drilling is being done by Bedrock Phil Church, who's drilled all the New Age wells in Cameroon and is drilling in Gabon at the moment, very experienced West African driller. And our G&G &G work is done by EPI. We've been working with very closely now for the best part of seven years. Um, so that's it. Appraisal and development in Cameroon, that's our main focus. And uh, we do some other exploration as well, uh, but that's for the longer term. Thank you very much indeed, Jeremy. I'm sure. I'm sure I'm applause. And let's have some questions now. Please wait till you get the mic. Anyone got any questions for Jeremy? Please raise your hand. Okay, well, while you have a think about that, perhaps I'll, you've, you've not mentioned the other big properties. I mean, Namibia, I know, is a much higher risk property than, than Cameroon. But you were talking last year about discussions with a major oil company, which sounded quite exciting. Where are we on that? Are the major oil companies still interested in your South African assets? Yes, they're still interested, but they are moving um, uh, very slowly now. Um, they were quite um, uh, uh, busy on it um, in the, uh, in the fourth, third and fourth quarters of last year, and then they slowed down markedly. Um, and they've explained that this is because of resource constraints on their side. They expect to pick up the pace later in the year. I think that there's another reason, which is that um, there's a couple of important wells coming up in the area. And also there's a bunch of multi-client work that's being done up here in the Wolvis. Um, and I think they want to see um, the results of that, uh, both the wells and also that multi-client work. And, uh, and I don't blame them, that would, that's what we want to do as well. We've got no particular plans to do a great deal of work until we also see what's coming in. The thing about um, Namibia is there have been different um, approaches generically to what kind of structures you look at. And, uh, you, you know, the blocks that we have, there's actually a slide a little further on in the appendix, which I'll share with you. Um, um, if you look at the, um, this bottom left-hand corner here, it gives a, a bit of a sort of top-down picture. For those who like the cross-sections, uh, there's the top right. But, but the, the, basically, 
in our block area, there's these giant structures, uh, and there was another one called Delta, which we already drilled. That was the one we did with Repsol uh, back in 2014, um, which superficially looked absolutely fantastic. They were four-way dip closures, and they were massive, and um, there was a great AVO anomaly over uh, one of them, which coincided so neatly with the structure. Uh, it seemed like the most exciting thing. And Repsol agreed, which is why they farmed in, and we drilled that well. Not successful, and the AVO anomaly was completely misleading. Um, at the moment, a lot of people, including us, are paying attention more towards the Graben, and in particular, the, the structures that are closer to shore. And the idea really is that it's an, uh, really a, more of an Albion play, but the, the, the idea really is that the oil has probably migrated in this direction because it obviously didn't go at least in that direction. Now, we haven't given up on the big structures, and one of the things that I notice about Exxon's strategy is that they seem more interested still in these deeper areas where the big structures are. But other people, like Shell and like Tullow, um, have been focusing much more on the... Um, on these areas that are a bit closer to shore, which is also, by the way, where Norse Kedro's wells on our blocks had the original oil shows. So, and those oil shows do indicate, um, uh, well, I won't talk too much about the, the potential sources of those, but suffice to say that it very much supports um, this idea. And that's why we're looking much more closely now at those areas closer to shore. But obviously, the more information that we have uh, from the wells that are being drilled at the moment, um, the better we can decide where to focus. Jerry, before you finish, the other thing we must discuss is cash. I mean, look, when you look at your assets, at first glance, all looks very attractive. And then you look at the market cap of the company, and it's something like £5 million. And the only explanation for that, I think, is that Tower needs more money to get done what it wants to get done. And that's clearly worrying markets, worrying investors. We're waiting for this deal, in get a farm in Cameroon or something in Namibia. What can you do to reassure markets and investors that you will get the money and you will be able to take things forward? Well, yeah, our market cap's around £6 million at the moment. And um, that's obviously completely... Um, uh, determined by investor uncertainty about how we're going to finance this appraisal well. Um, my own belief is that we can do the farm out. I, otherwise, we wouldn't be doing the things we're doing. Um, we've done the site survey, which is quite expensive. Um, last year, uh, rather than tap shareholders for money, um, I put in myself a uh, three quarters of a million dollar debt facility um, as a bridging facility to minimize at the time the amount that we had to raise from the market. We also did a fundraising which I cornerstone myself. So I obviously believe that we can get this done. But on the other hand, you know, one has to be realistic about how one goes about doing things and, you know, doing a strategic deal, uh, okay, $15 million, it's not exactly um, like uh, Premier Oil or something, but it, 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 for the kind of companies who would be interested in working with us on a project like this, it's a significant amount of money. And everybody's got, uh, or at least the last year, had the same problems raising money from the market that, that we had. So you had to work with people who either had money from other sources for their own reasons um, or had production or something like that, but then they themselves would be waiting for cash from production, waiting for cash to come from the sale of another asset. So you can't simply say, well, this is my timing 
and you've got to sort of do things according to my timetable. The art of doing a strategic deal, and I've done plenty of them, I'm a bit grey in the hair myself, uh, is that you've got to be ready to work with other people and work with their timing. But one of the key problems that we had was that not only did we have to work with other people's timing, we also had to um, deal with the license extension and the usual slowness uh, in Cameroon in getting what was agreed actually reduced to paper. So that took a chunk of time out. Since we got that document in January, the pace has really picked up on those discussions. And also the market generally feels better. And even though we're not planning to go to the market to raise this uh, $15 million, it does affect the climate in which other people can make investments. So altogether, I'm quite confident we'll get it done. I'm quite confident that we'll meet that schedule to get the well underway by the end of the second quarter. Um, and, uh, you know, if I didn't think that, uh, we'd be, we wouldn't be talking in the way that we are. Got a question at the back. Um, we we uh, asked the chat boards uh, on the website earlier if they had any questions for you. Um, sure. the, uh, the, the, the TRP chat board's quite active on the site. I think you may have covered them, actually. There was three questions. Um, uh, somebody asked, actually, about the equity raise, which you obviously just spoken about, whether you... Uh, they asked, um, it was a chat called uh, Big Bear 2, um, please ask of equity raise expected as part of the finance for drill. I think you've just covered yeah, that effectively. I, mean, I, I don't rule out um, uh, uh, doing some equity. If It, it depends entirely on, you know, there, there's several people we're talking with and some people want to do the whole thing if they go ahead and some people want to do part. And um, we could parcel it out to a couple of different people, part and part. Another option, if, if somebody wants to do most of it, given the fact that we've already put a bunch of the money in anyway, is that we could always do a farm out deal and then top it up from the market. Um, but I, I'm certainly not planning to go to the market for the whole 15 million. Another thing to bear in mind is that you know, we might always come to the market for a little bit of working capital, but again, I, I don't really want to do that until it's quite clear that we're getting the bulk of the money from somewhere else. There's a, there was a couple of other questions, and again, I think you've um, covered um, oil man Mike, who said he's got a significant holding um, in, in the firm, um, asked about the Cameroon farm out and the drill schedule. I think, again, you've covered that. Yes, or? exactly. I, and and uh, we'll be clarifying it further, I mean, the, 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 the schedule in this uh, presentation I've just given you, yeah. we'll be putting it onto the website in the morning. Fabulous. Um, thank you for that. Last chance for a question for Jeremy? No? Well, that's very interesting. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, really interesting stuff. Let's give him a round of applause. And our next speaker is Elaine Reynolds. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Elaine is an energy analyst at Edison. Edison provide investment research uh, for lots of companies on the stock market. She's been working there for about 10 years. Prior to that, she has experience elsewhere working in the oil industry. Uh, she's worked for companies like Texaco, amongst many others. And uh, Elaine, I think, is going to be concentrating on a few different uh, geographical areas and prospects for them at the moment. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, as Ed said, um, my background is from the oil industry. Um, I should point out it's as a petroleum engineer and absolutely not as a geologist. Uh, I've spent many years working with geologists, but uh, I am not one for sure. Um, I'm going to be talking tonight uh, about a range of stories covering exploration and appraisal, uh, all with some small to mid cap, -cap company involvement. Uh, which I hope you'll find of interest. If you do and you'd like to know some more, uh, these are all covered on various video videos that are free to access, uh, done by myself on the Edison website. Um, before I start, I'll just do a quick uh, skip through um, what Edison does. Um, we are known as a paid for uh, corporate research that we provide. Um, but we also um, provide a full range of investor relations services and we do um, bespoke uh, consulting for public and private companies. Uh, we cover uh, a range of sectors, including the resources wh which uh, oil and gas is a part of. 
Uh, this is just a quick slide to show you who's in the team. Uh, apart from uh, myself and uh, the other analyst, uh, Carlos, you can see we have investor relations and marketing people working with us in the team. Uh, and this is just uh, a sample of the clients that we have at the moment uh, in, the, in oil and gas. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about exploration offshore Guyana and Suriname. Um, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Eco Atlantic for allowing uh, me to use their slides uh, to talk about this this evening. Um, uh, uh, Guyana has been a major success story for the industry in recent years. Um, ExxonMobil made the first discovery here in 2015 with its Lisa One well, which sits in the Staybrook block. Uh, and since then, uh, they've made 15 further discoveries with resources uh, to date of 8 billion barrels of oil equivalent. Uh, the first phase of uh, the Lisa development came on stream in December last year and is currently ramping up to 120,000 barrels of oil per day. But what I'd like to talk a bit more about uh, tonight uh, is the exploration we've seen um, in 2019 into early 2020 across two separate blocks beyond ExxonMobil's acreage. And that's uh, in the Orondoik block, uh, which you is labelled on here because uh, Echo Atlantic is a partner here. This block is operated by Tullow Oil uh, and uh, Total is also a partner here. Uh, and uh, the joint venture made discoveries on two wells here, uh, two prospects, Jethro One and Joe One. And then in the Kanuku block, which is not labelled but sits directly to the south of Orondoik, um, uh, this is operated by Spanish company Repsol, uh, but uh, a couple of the partners in Orondoik, Tullo and Total, are also partners uh, in Kanuku. And uh, they made a discovery uh, in the Carapa one well. So if we look at a cross section, oh sorry I didn't, I hope it's clear from this that this swathe of uh, green on the right is all of the uh, Exxon discoveries as well. So if we look at this cross section, the um, coast of Guyana sits to the left of the slide and we go through the Kanuku block, through Orondoik to Staybrook, uh, going uh, through progressively deeper waters. <clears throat> um, all the discoveries are shown on this slide uh, in green, but you can see that there's a, a lot of prospects here uh, that uh, have prospectivity uh, across all the blocks. Now, you can see Lisa on the far right, just at the bottom there, uh, and that should, you can see that that's a Cretaceous discovery. This is typical of the bulk of the ExxonMobil discoveries, um, but one exception to that is the hammerhead discovery uh, shown on here. And you can see that that's a lower tertiary discovery. Uh, you can also see from the schematic uh, a suggestion that hammerhead extends into the Orondoik block. So when the joint venture uh, decided to drill two wells here, they chose to go for the tertiary as as uh, proved up in Hammerhead. Um, uh, both Jethro and Joe were targeting over 100 million barrels of oil and both encountered uh, good quality sands. Um, Jethro 1 encountered 55 metres of net pay, which was above expectations. Um, Joe 1 uh, was much thinner than expected with 16 metres of net pay. Uh, but it's still important because it's the first well to uh, prove, prove up the presence of oil in the upper tertiary uh, because Jethro 1 and Hammerhead 1 are both lower tertiary discoveries. Um, what was less expected though was that the oil here would be heavy, which it turned out to be. Heavy oil is characterised as having an API of less than 20 degrees. Um, the oil in Joe 1 and Jethro 1 is described as having uh, an API of between 11 and 14 <coughs> degrees API. Uh, on top of that, there's a, a 4 to 5% sulphur content. 
So this would make uh, a development more challenging here, but it's not um, impossible. Uh, there are some mitigating circumstances. In Jethro 1, the reservoir pressure and temperature is quite high, uh, so the oil is mobile under reservoir conditions, so this could help with uh, flow, flow assurance uh, in any development. Um, the reason it wasn't really expected is uh, we know that the API at LISA is 32 degrees API. Um, we know that at Hammerhead it's slightly heavier. It's not been publicly discussed uh, or known about, but we believe it's in the region of 18 to 25 degrees API. Uh, and ExxonMobil partner Hess had stated uh, that they thought that the well, uh, that oil was getting progressively heavier the closer we got to shore. So the next well to be drilled on the Kanuku block uh, was, was being watched with interest to see uh, what sort of API would be found here. Um, Carapa was targeting the Cretaceous, so different to Joe and Jethro, um, and over, targeting over 200 million barrels of oil. Um, it only found four metres of sands, so uh, it's not commercial, but most importantly, it did discover light oil of 27 degrees API. So this has de-risked a lot of the Cretaceous uh, prospects across Kanuku and Orendoik, um, and uh, so that's positive for the future. If we go back to my first slide, <clears throat> The joint venture on Orendoik has budgeted to drill two further wells this year. Um, we don't have any details about that at the moment. Um, I would suggest that it's quite likely that any well that is drilled this year uh, would be targeting a Cretaceous reservoir, given that uh, that's where we've seen the, the light oil. And also possibly um, in this southeastern section, I don't know if I'm way off here, <laughs> but the bottom southeast section of, of Orendoik, where you can see uh, it be in line with Carapa 1 and out to Lisa, uh, that's a, a more likely area where they can show that there'll be high, uh, lighter oil. Um, <clears throat> if we go back to the cross section, uh, that area would be sitting uh, to the right here between Jethro 1 and Hammerhead. And you can also see that uh, it could be possible with a well to target uh, more than one of these prospects with one well. Um, now, since the success in Guyana, there have been a number of attempts to replicate it um, across the maritime boundary into offshore area of Suriname. Uh, a few wells were drilled uh, between 2015 and 2017 by Apache and also by Tullow, uh, but none of them were found to be commercial. However, um, at the beginning of this year, Apache announced that it had made a discovery in its Maca Central 1 well. That's shown as MKC1, uh, very close to the, to the maritime boundary here in Block 58. Um, the well encountered 123 metres of net pay across stacked intervals in the Cretaceous um, and it's oil and gas condensate, so very light oil, up to 60 degrees uh, for the gas condensate, which is not particularly surprising. Uh, straight over the border there you can see Haimara or Haimara, which was a gas condensate discovery for Exxon Mobil. Um, so I think moving forward into 2020 and beyond, there could be a lot more uh, interest now in Suriname that we've had this discovery. Apache has already moved on to the Sapakara West One Well, 20 kilometres to the southeast of uh, Maka Central One. So we should look out for results here uh, in the coming months. Um, in addition, it's not shown on this slide, um, but Tullow Oil. Uh, has uh, interest in block 47, which is directly north of block 53 uh, that's shown there. Um, they are planning to drill a well there uh, in the second half of this year, targeting the Cretaceous. The prospect is uh, called the Goliathberg North, so that's something to look out for. Also, Cairn Energy um, has acreage here uh, to the east of Tullow's block, uh, but they're at a much earlier stage, uh, having just take, um, carried out a 2D seismic acquisition, uh, and they're working on that now. 
Um, so that's it for Guyana and Suriname. I'm going to go somewhere completely different now and talk about uh, the North Slope of Alaska, where um, a potentially high impact well is about to be spudded uh, by 88 Energy. It's due to start drilling um, by the end of this month. Um, the well Charlie 1 is targeting over 1.6 billion barrels of prospective resources in an emerging play in this proven basin. Um, historically, wells in Alaska targeted the Jurassic Reservoir. However, since 2013, there have been over 4 billion barrels of oil discovered in the Cretaceous Brookian Plate, and the first of these was in Pika. Oh, sorry about that. Pika, which is uh, up here. And Willow has extended it, the play to the west. And Horseshoe, which isn't shown on here, but it's um, about here to the south. So 88 Energy holds over 480,000 acres in the area known as Project Icewine. Um, and they're focusing on the western part shown here in orange and known as Area A. And this is where the Charlie One well will be drilled. Uh, in 2019, Premier Oil farmed into Area A. Uh, it has 60% uh, and will cover the costs of the drilling of the well up to $23 million. Charlie One is actually an appraisal of a 1991 well drilled by BP, uh, which was targeting the deeper Cretaceous but encountered oil uh, in, in some uh, shallower targets in the Cretaceous Brookian, and this uh, will be the primary target of Charlie 1. So although it's uh, going to be drilling through seven targets, the important ones are, <laughs> are the ones, the deepest ones here, oh, I cannot, the, the three deepest ones, the upper, middle, and lower stellar, uh, oil was encountered in Malguk 1, the BP well, in the upper and middle stellar uh, horizons. So the well is being designed to test the deliverability of those uh, deeper primary targets. And the plan, uh, if hydrocarbons are encountered, is to frack the well and flow it. If that's also successful, uh, by the end of the year, um, the plan is to drill a lateral side track uh, with a view to testing uh, er early in 2021. Uh, while the total prospective resources targeted in the well is 1.6 billion barrels, uh, the main targets are targeting over 600 million barrels. Finally, about five minutes today. yeah, I'm almost done. Finally, uh, I'm going to come closer to home uh, and to the Southern North Sea, which is an area more you, there's a mature producing area. Uh, this section of the North Sea is more closely associated with late life field development. Um, but uh, in the last year, there have been uh, a couple of farm outs from independent companies, uh, Clough Natural Resources and Egden Resources uh, to Shell. Uh, so I'd just like to talk a bit about that because uh, the licenses that Shell is interested in all contain uh, prospectivity in the Zechstein Reservoir. Um, in the Southern North Sea, the primary producing region is the uh, formation is the Permian with the Zechstein, uh, the shallower Zechstein as a seal for the Permian. Um, so it's quite interesting that Shell has come in here uh, at this stage. Um, Egdon Resources announced uh, at the beginning of this year that Shell had farmed into a 70% interest in its resolution and Endeavour uh, licences. I'm, I'm not very good at this, so, and this isn't very clear on the slide, but the licences just sit off the North Yorkshire clo coast. Uh, you can see them surrounded with that green uh, parallelogram. I hope you can just see it. Um, resolution was uh, discovered in 1966 by Total uh, and has been independently assessed by Schlumberger to hold two sea resources of 206 BCF. Uh, resolution is a Zestine carbonate reef 
Now, this is characterised by a tight matrix that relies on the presence of natural fractures um, and fracture stimulation for, uh, for providing flow. Uh, so, there is some uncertainty over uh, the resource figure for resolution, uh, and we really need a 3D seismic to look at the presence and distribution of those fractures. And as a result of the farm out to Shell, uh, this seismic uh, survey is going to be carried out this summer. Similarly, um, Clough Natural Resources last year farmed out 70% of its licence that contains the Pensacola prospect. I don't have an image of that, but it sits around 20 kilometres to the northeast of Resolution. Um, so it's in a, the same general area. Um, Pensacola is estimated by Clough Natural Resources to hold uh, prospective resources of 309 BCF. Um, and as a result of the farm out, a 3D seismic survey has already been carried out here uh, with results expected this summer. Um, finally, um, I don't have any slides on this, but it's quite an interesting well that I think ties into this. Um, to the east of Pensacola, uh, there's a well, you may see it referred to as Ocean Darach or Darach Central One. It was drilled last summer by the Dutch company One Dias. Um, the well uh, sits right on the northernmost fringes of the Southern North Sea, but the interesting thing about it is it's discovered oil, uh, which was not expected. <laughs> Um, before drilling, the, the well was targeting, was believed to be targeting the Zechstein and the Carboniferous. Um, since the well has been drilled, uh, there's not been much on information that has come out about it. We do know that um, it has been tested and produced at 3,800 barrels of oil per day. Um, if it is from the Zechstein, uh, I think that would be um, quite a, a good... Uh, news for the area. Um, so I think it's quite interesting that that, that is also there and uh, is in this sort of cluster off the coast. Um, that's all I was, have to uh, show you today. Uh, just a quick reminder uh, that this is all uh, available on the website in more detail if you're interested. Thank, thank you, you Elaine. I should say I've seen some of Elaine's bite-sized briefings on the web. They're very interesting. But Elaine, thanks very much for your talk just now. Thank you. Have any questions for Elaine? Stick your hand up if you do. No? Okay, well, I'll just ask, ask one quick one then, Elaine. Out of these, which is the one that sort of excites you most? Which is the one you think, gosh, that's the one I'd like to be involved with? Um, that's tricky. I think probably Guyana, uh, because there's a wide range here. You can see um, there's lots of options and it may not work straight away but I think eventually something's going to going to come come out here. Uh, Alaska is also very exciting because it's a such a large number uh, but it is just a one one well at the moment and there's no further follow-on uh, uh, if it doesn't work out right now. Elaine thank you very much indeed. Very Okay, and now we're going to have our final talk from Keith Hiscox, uh, CEO of Hardman & Co. As I said before, this is moving away uh, from oil. Keith has been working in the city for something like 40 years. In the past, he's worked for James Capel, Horgavet, lots of uh, names that were very famous and well-respected in the past, even if some of them have disappeared now. He's been CEO at Hardman since 2012. Hardman are a broker for small and mid-caps. They also do paid-for research, so he really understands uh, the small and mid-cap end of the market. And we're going to hear more about some new research that his firm have just done. So, Keith, please tell us more. Thank you very much. Um, I think when we set this um, uh, talk up, um, Donald and I didn't realise quite how timely what I'm going to talk about is because on the way home, you might want to pick up the Evening Standard and the lead article in the Evening Standard by Anthony Hilton is entitled overzealous watchdogs have put the bite on liquidity. So I'm going to be talking about share ownership, price discovery, liquidity and market makers. Um, I'll explain a little bit about what Hardman does. Hardman is not a broker. I, I need to correct you on that. Hardman is, uh, in many respects, very similar 
to Edison. So we're the largest, the two of us are the largest players by far in the sponsored research world. So we write research about accredited companies paid for by those companies uh, and made available to every sort of investor through a series of, me of uh, mechanisms. We're also a leading uh, research house in the tax enhanced space. So that's Business Relief, IHT, EIS. Uh, and then we have bespoke services where we use the skill sets of our analysts um, to help companies, uh, stock exchanges, expert witness work for court cases, due diligence reports. There's some stock exchanges you want to list on, you have to get a DD report from us, the exchange, uh, and various other um, um, uses. So, um, share ownership, price discovery, liquidity, and market makers. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is, first of all, the difficulty of determining who owns what in the stock market. Then I'm going to tell you who owns the stock market. Then I'm going to talk about the change in that ownership over time, both for rest of the world investors and retail investors. And you'll understand why when you see the numbers. I'm going to then talk about the retail investors impact on prices, which I suspect is quite interesting for this audience. I'm going to talk about why anybody cares about liquidity. And then finally, uh, Donald wants me to say a few words about market makers. So uh, what can we know about share ownership? Well, the first thing when you look at a share uh, is, or a company is to work out where its domicile is because the rules are very, very different. So if you're a UK domiciled company, your register has to be a public record. Anybody can turn up and ask the registrar to look through it. And there are some services, the one with whom we've done a lot of work recently called Argus Vickers, who have a whole team doing that all the time. If you're not a UK registered company, it's a bit different. So for example, if you're registered in Guernsey or Jersey, or Jersey um, the data available is much more restricted. However, when I say that if you're a UK company, you can see who owns every share, you can, but most of the shares are owned by nominees. Now, if you're private investors here, almost certainly very few of you own shares directly in your own name because it's really difficult to deal through Crest. If that's what you've got, you'll own it through your broker's nominees. Um, and that's true of most shareholdings in the market. However, there is some help provided uh, by announcements. So if you look through the RNSs that come through every day, you'll see there are certain situations where um, the beneficial owner has to declare his interest. It may be in a nominee, but he has to declare it. So for example, in a takeover situation, the rules, rule eight, requires you to disclose, if you're dealing in stocks, who the beneficial owner is. There's no good just giving the, uh, the nominee name. Now, obviously, in putting all of those RNSs together, you can build up a database of who is behind each nominee account. And there are services like Argus Vic Vickers that take all of that data and then apply it across the market to try and understand who owns the market. There are, there are good and bad reasons for, for, for using nominees. We can talk about that later if you want. Um, so you can create a database from these Rule 8 announcements and work out who owns it. So, so here it is. So this is our work with Argus Vickers. So this is, you won't be able to read this probably at the back of the room, so I'll describe some of the important elements. So this is who owns the market uh, on the last day of June 2019. And it's split by different parts of the market. So if you look at the whole market and you exclude the NEX market, so I'm looking at the whole of the London Stock Exchange market, 64% of the market is owned by the rest of the world investors. Of FTSE, it's a bit higher, it's 69.6%. Of the main market, so that's excluding FTSE, it's 48.9%. And then it falls away quite rapidly. So the rest of the world owns 36.9% of AIM. Still a large number, but it's a lot less than it is of the market as a whole. And in, on the NEX market, it's only 7.6%. If you do the same exercise for individuals, you find a really different pattern. So you'll find that individuals own 8.3% of the London stock market as a whole. Um, they own 5.3% of FTSE, but as you go down, you find that figure rises dramatically. So AIM, 
is owned by uh, the retail investor or an individual investor, and in, on NEX, it's 52%. So that's, that's a snapshot of the picture of the, today, and there are all the other categories down there you can look at in, in your leisure. But now it gets a bit more interesting. The rest of the world shareholdings over time. So the rest of the world investor is the largest holder of large parts of the market. But how has that changed? Well, that's really quite a recent phenomenon. You won't be able to read the detail here, uh, but I can tell you back in, 1963, when the ONS first started their work, rest of the world investors owned 7% of the market. There were a few what you might call ex-colonial stocks, like you know, plantations, where the rest of the world investor was quite important, but the market overall, they were not important. Only 7% against, well over 50% today. In fact, the 7% fell in the subsequent years until 1981. In 1981, the rest of the world investor owned only 3.6% of the market. So what's happened to transform them to being the biggest investor in the market? Well, several things. So the shape of the market has changed. So London has become the international stock market. It is the place to list, unless you're an American generally, uh, if, if you're looking for overseas investors. So when apartheid came along, all of the South African, the big South African companies decided they wanted to move their listing to London because the biggest pool of international investors was in London. So part of the change in the rest of the world is the shape of the UK stock market has changed. In a way, it's not a UK stock market, it's an international stock market, and that's brought overseas investors. You've also seen, obviously, um, uh, a change in the institutional shape, and so you know, a number of UK investment managers become part of international groups. If you now look at the retail investor, the story is sort of the reverse. So back in dear old 1963, uh, the UK investor owned more than half the London stock market. It's actually 54%. And it has consistently fallen since then. Why is that? I think it's consistently fallen because um, the UK investor has been driven by marketing, by regulatory regime, by a change in the shape of products and offer, into collective products, into you know, open-ended investment companies or, um, or uh, unit trusts, that sort of thing, and increasingly holds and has held uh, his interest in the market through those rather than through individual shares. This figure, though, bottomed out in 2008, when the retail investor owned 10.2% in the market. Since then, there has been a consistent increase. The latest figures using this series is 13.5%. And what's behind that? Well, I think several things are behind that. I think, first of all, I'd like to think investing has become a bit easier. There's a lot more information available over the internet about companies than there was. I recognise entirely that it's still not a level playing field with institutional investors, but I think it has become a bit easier. Um, I think investors are paying more attention and more interest in direct investment. So, for example, um, the introduction of SIPs uh, for pension funds has allowed people to manage their own money and they've started to by individual shares. So I think there's, there's a change going on and I think it's uh, likely to continue. And so you can argue that the retail investor is becoming more important in the market. Obviously, it's extremely important on AIM, is extremely important at the small cap end of the f main market and is also very important on NEX. But actually, these figures hide the impact of the retail investor on the market. So if you look at the trade sizes on the market, this is a very interesting story. So what I've taken here is a snapshot. Um, these, both of these snapshots are in November 2019. So the one at the top is uh, of the AIM market. So let's deal with that first. So if you took every company on the market and ranked it by the average trade size, and then looked at what baskets they fall into, what you will find is approximately 83% of AIM listed companies have an average trade size 
of less than £10,000. Now, we can't know who's on the other side of it. We can't say, well, that's definitely a retail investor, but I don't think it's an outrageous hypothesis to suggest that the smaller this figure, the more important the retail investor is to it. And you might say, well, so that's November 19. How realistic is that? You know, is that, is that an unusual month? Well, we've, we've done this exercise over many years, and the number's always between 83 and 85%. The table below does exactly the same thing, but for the LSE main market. Now, you might say that's going to be very different, isn't it? The answer is it is different, but it's nowhere near as different as you might think. So if you look at, again, companies who have an average trade size or bargain size of less than £10,000, they account for 75% of all the listed companies on the main market. Now, why is this important? This is important because I think for most companies, on most days of the year, it's the retail investor, the small trade, that sets the price. So we often have the managements of companies coming in to see us, and they say, I've kind of worked out what goes on here, which is that every so often there's a big trade. You know, there's an institution uh, wants to take a stake or sell a stake, or the company wants to raise money. That, the other side of that trade is going to be an institutional investor or investors or professional investors for two reasons. They can deal in size and they can deal very quickly. But the price at which that trade takes place starts from the price in the days and the weeks before. It might be a discount to that price, it might be a premium. And that price has been set by lots of little trades. So they might think of it, companies or institutional brokers might think of it as the tail wagging the dog. But the reality is that for most days, for most companies, it's small trades that set the price. Now, I've used the term liquidity, which is another way of saying how, much of the sh how many shares change hands, what percentage of the company change hands. There are various definitions around that. Why does it matter? Now, some people say it doesn't matter. Every share is always owned by somebody. Why does it matter who owns it? Well, I think if you were a, uh, an investor in the Woodford uh, uh, Equity Income Fund, you would be concerned about it because you've not been able to get your money out because many of the stocks in which uh, the Woodford Fund has invested are illiquid. Many of them are private companies, obviously, and they're particularly illiquid. The FCA has been getting quite concerned about this uh, and has been putting out some guidance uh, about liquidity. It's not a great deal of help because it doesn't tell you what you've got to do as a fund manager, but it says, look, you need to pay attention to liquidity if you're going to provide, for example, daily pricing uh, for investors. So uh, most institutions now are worrying about liquidity in their underlying holdings. Uh, they're worrying because they've got the FCA leaning on them, they've got their own compliance departments leaning on them, they've got investors in their funds leaning on them. Uh, and so increasingly they are using a filter. So, you know, they've always used a filter you know, depending upon what your mandate is, if you're an income fund, then you want a minimum income of X. There'll be some other financial criteria around that. So if you're an income fund, you might say, you know, I need a free cash flow cover of the dividend yield of, of Y. But increasingly now, you've got a liquidity filter. You want to be sure that if you are investing money um, in a stock, that you can get out of that holding should you need to, should there be... Um, you know, redemptions of your fund if you're, if you're a, a, a unit trust, for example. Uh, I talked to one fund manager a couple of weeks ago who said, I've gone through that exercise and I've worked out that if I look back over time, and I can only look back over time at the liquidity in the stock, one of my holdings will take me 93 years to get out of. Um, so it is important, uh, and I say to companies that if you ignore liquidity, 
you run the risk of dropping out of the market. Institutions won't be able to buy you. Um, you know, your share price will come under downward pressure. Uh, you'll find it more difficult to raise money. And frankly, there's no point being a quoted company. I mean, you know, a stock market is a market and a market only exists if there's liquidity. If things happen, that's what a market is. So briefly, how can a company improve its liquidity if, if you agree that it's something that one should worry about? Well, there are lots of things you can do and here are some suggestions. So the first thing is I always encourage companies to be much more open and transparent about their results and who can get to see stuff. So I go to, I have the privilege, uh, I think it is a privilege, of being able to attend results meetings by companies. So this is where a bunch of analysts get invited along to discuss um, a set of results from a quoted company. At those meetings, there is a discussion, there is a presentation pack um, I always say to companies, I see absolutely no reason why you shouldn't, the moment you start that meeting, post that presentation pack on your website so that all of your investors uh, can see that. I see no reason why you can't record the meeting because obviously, you know, the chief executive talks to the slides and there's a bit of extra flavour and you should be treating all investors equally. That's what the corporate governance guides say. If you're, if you're saying something to the slides in addition, which only the institutional broking audience uh, can see, that's not being fair. I don't see any reason really why there can't be, that, why there can't be a, uh, an audio or a video of the whole thing, including the questions. So I always encourage companies to do that. And I think, you know, the more transparent you can be as a company, the more you can engage with investors, the more likely they are um, to, to invest in you. The second thing is hosting Capital Markets Days. This has become a bit more popular. Uh, this is where you get the chance to hear not just the chief executive or the CFO, but you know, ideally you get to hear people running divisions or people interfacing with the customers of the business or the supply chain, give you much more of an idea. Because I think for most investors outside the professional sphere, often the only chance you get to meet the management and ask questions is the AGM, which is a generally rather dull affair and formulaic affair. Um, so, you know, we'd always recommend Capital Markets Day. Of course, I'm going to say employ a sponsored research house and, you know, you've got a choice of two here uh, because both of, of our company's research is available to every sort of investor and it meets a series of quality thresholds. I mean, we both employ people who um, have got long histories in, um, uh, as institutional uh, analysts, for example. Um, I'd encourage companies to attend retail events. So there's a number of shows that take place, and you're, you're, you've probably been to more of them than I have. You know, Mellow, UK Investor, those sorts of things are a way, another way of engaging with a, a broader audience. Yeah, 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 fine. No, I'll be there. Um, uh, obviously, using the likes of LSE uh, is another way of getting to a wider audience, understanding your share register. So, you know, if, you, if I were a company, I'd be looking at who owns companies that are similar to mine and asking myself, well, why don't they own mine? Um, and then um, possibly the most controversial is including retail in fundraising. And I'll come on and talk to the, about that a little bit more in, in, um, uh, in what I'm going to say about market makers. Now, the LSE has actually got a bit of an initiative around here. So they've just struck a deal with um, primary bid um, to try and engage more with retail investors when there are, when there are fundraising. So, so there are some really quite positive steps taking place there. So apart from the summary slide, this is the last slide. Um, so Donna wanted me to talk about market makers. Um, uh, I'll show my age because um, I used to call them jobbers. Um, uh, before 1986, before uh, Big Bang, they were called jobbers. These were separate businesses. You were not allowed to be both a broker and a market maker, as we call it today. That was, that was, that was banned. Uh, you had to be single capacity as a business. You had to decide, um, am I going to make markets and be a jobber or am I going to be a broker? That all went uh, and uh, what we call jobbers became market makers. Uh, so these are parts of business, 
investment banks, the you know, small cap brokers, etc., cetera, um, whose job is to make money as a market maker. Now, there are two, there's nothing wrong with that at all. There are sort of two broad sorts of it, and, and, and the, the phrase is used a bit too widely. The first is where you're actually putting your own capital up to make money, and the other is where you're just facilitating trade. Now, if you're, if you're talking about you know, a FTSE stock, billions of shares, billions of pounds worth of shares change hands every month, and it's pretty easy to build a position and get out of that position. And you know, the idea is to take a small turn out in the middle. It's also, not only is it liquid, but if you, for example, took the view that the market's going to collapse, uh, you think, well, I might not be able to get out of my book, but I could buy an ETF, or, you know, I could go, or I could go short or something, or I could buy a future to go short of the FTSE. That's possible in those sorts of stocks. As you move down from those stocks, that becomes more and more difficult. Uh, you, you end up taking a position overnight using your capital. Now, the amount of capital that's committed to market making has shrunk dramatically over the last few years. It's, not, it's been a difficult business. But the other thing that market makers do is to facilitate trade. So there are some stocks where there's one or maybe two uh, market makers, and largely it's not really about putting a lot of capital at risk, it's facilitating. Uh, you know, ideally they'd like to cross stock and not have a position, but sometimes they need to have a position. You'll find very clearly that the lower the liquidity in a stock, the wider the, the difference is between the bid and the offer, if, if you've got level one, for example. Um, so that's the role of market makers. Uh, it's to try and provide some fluidity and liquidity in the marketplace. Um, but I think the area that's probably most interesting and, and controversial um, is around fundraisings. So there will be some commentators who say, if you look in particular AIM, so you, you know on AIM there's not, there's not necessarily a preemption right. So if you're a shareholder in a company, let's say you own 5% of the company, if you're on the main market, if the company raises new money, unless it gets approval from an extraordinary general meeting, it has to offer you 5%. Those rules don't necessarily apply for stocks on AIM. Right? And I think where people find this tricky is you come in in the morning, uh, the company's decided to raise a reasonable sum of money, we issued quite a lot of shares, it's issued it at a big discount to the existing share price, and you as a shareholder in it aren't offered any. It's been placed with a few institutions, and that's where I think people feel uncomfortable. Now, I'll explain the reasons for it in a minute, but people feel uncomfortable about that because you've not had the chance, you've not been treated as in the same way as, a, as an institution might have been treated. And inevitably that leads to some suspicion that there's been some manipulation of the share price. Obviously you'd be particularly concerned if the share price went back to where it was, you know, a day or two after replacing had taken place at half the price that it was, um, that it was before. I think the reason that that happens is that um, the, uh, the, the LSE in particular wants to make it easier for smaller companies to raise money. And if you have to involve everybody, the way in particular some of the rules around prospectus works, there's quite a lot of legal cost involved uh, and um, it takes a lot more time. Whereas you could do a placing on a raise a bunch of money overnight effectively. So, so that's why they do it. Now, obviously, the LSE with, uh, as I just said earlier on, uh, with primary bid um, are trying to encourage retail investors to get involved. But I think that's probably the most controversial area. area. So I've talked about how difficult it is to determine who owns what in the market. I've shown you who owns the stock market today. I've shown you that the rest of the world investor has become dramatically more important than than they were before uh, 1986. I've shown that the retail investors became dramatically less important in the market, but has since recovered. I've argued that the retail investor has a bigger impact on share prices than their ownership of the market would suggest. 
I've explained why I think liquidity matters in the market, the sorts of things you can do about it. Uh, and finally, I've said a few words about market makers. Thank you very much, Keith. Fascinating stuff. <laughs> Any questions for Keith? Retail investors, I've only become aware of this business about liquidity in literally in the last few weeks, and mm -hmm. I've read the article you're referring to in the Standard, and I'm really uh, saying what you have done here is to analyze, if you like, the issues that arise from the lack of liquidity and the place of the retail investor in that arena. And what I would like to uh, uh, ask you, I mean, ask Hardman and, and maybe LSE as well, really, to turn yourself into a campaigner to actually help the retail investor um, you know, gain a foothold on an equal basis with the rest of the institutional investor, etc. So that, because, you know, I mean, this business of nominee account is really uh, a disenfranchisement of, of the retail investor. But, you know, I mean, for instance, like, I don't know, you probably have heard of ShareSock, one mm -hmm. of the uh, you know, uh, they are campaigning for this this problem, and I want I want to just make a plea for, you know, for this forum, you know, to 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 become aligned, if you like, with other organisation and and help help us, <laughs> you know. Um, Thank you. As I said, Keith, any thoughts? Yes. Yeah, so so um, obviously we make our research available to everybody. We encourage companies to engage with investors, uh, all sorts of investors. We've done all that. I think your question in particular is pointed at the fact that effectively you're forced to own your shares through a nominee and you therefore cannot directly vote. Uh, and I agree with you entirely. I can't believe in this day and age that we can't have a system that enables the nominee to effectively hand back your vote for an AGM or, or for whatever. Uh, I, I agree with you entirely, and, and uh, I know ShareSock has campaigned about that, and I'd certainly support them on that. Any more questions? Okay, well, just have a quick one from me then. On market makers, uh, very interesting what you were saying around IPOs and placings and how there's suspicion there of what market makers do. But beyond that, often when I read discussion boards for private investors, there's wider skepticism about market makers. You sort of read, oh, well, market makers are moving the prices around purely to sort of diddle private investors and rip us off. Is there any fairness in those accusations? I, I, don't, I don't think that's true. Um, I mean, obviously, they're there to make money. Um, uh, of course, they, they have to because they've got capital at risk sometimes. Um, I think it's, the, it's simply the lack of liquidity. So, you know, if you're, put yourself in the position of a market maker. If it's a stock where there's very little liquidity, you're the only market maker. Somebody comes and sells you some stock, um, you know, wants to sell you some stock. You'll probably mark the price down to get it. Then you really want to get it off your book as soon as possible because you want to keep your capital as tight as possible. Uh, and, you know, you're, you could well end up marking it down, depends on market conditions, lots of other things, You'd, you could well end up marking it down until you find a level at which there is a buyer. So certainly for those stocks where the liquidity is poorer, you'll find that the share price is much more volatile. It's not because market makers want to do it, it's simply a reflection of the situation that faces them. And, and go back to what I said earlier, if you were market making in the FTSE, you know, or even in you know, the, the, the main market as a whole, you've got available to you a series of mechanisms to reduce your risk. Um, so, you know, you can, if you don't, if you think the market's going to go down as a whole, um, you can, you know, you can buy a put on the, on, on, on the index. You can't do that in the small cap world. Those sorts of things. I mean, I've, I've been in a situation um, at businesses where we make markets, made markets in lots of small cap stocks. We struck the market maker, look, you know, we think this market's going to take a bit of a tumble, the market as a whole. Can we make sure we stay off the bid and everything? I'm telling you, as hard as you try, you cannot stay off the bid and you end up accumulating stock and you can't take a kind of future or derivative against it to guard, to guard against your risk. So I have a lot of sympathy for what they do and it's partly related to, um, partly related to the lack of liquidity. Last chance for a question. Okay, uh, can I just jump in and ask you a question, Keith? Yeah. What, what made you do the research in the first place? 
So um, I think there's uh, a lack of understanding of the role of different sorts of investors in the market. Uh, the ONS, the Office for National Statistics, has done work in this space every two years back to 1963. That's where some of that data came from. I don't want to be critical of the ONS. It's owned by the government and it's, you know, it's their job to find um, uh, out what's going on. But what they do is they take a sample of 200 companies. Uh, our work is based on every company uh, and they look at it every two years, whereas we've looked at it every half year. The, 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 the survey they just published in January, the data they're using is from December 2018, so it's over a year old, whereas the data we've just used is from June 2019. So I think it's valuable to understand who owns the market. I think it's particularly valuable for you as investors to realise actually you're, you're more important than perhaps you, you think you are. But if you combine the ownership of the market with these average trade sizes, you begin to realise actually you're a lot more important than, um, than many companies realise. I often, uh, you know, when we go and do um, a pitch to a company um, about our services, we always look at what the average trade size is. I've yet to come across one company in all the, I must have done hundreds of these. I've yet to come across one company who knows what that figure is. It, it comes as a complete surprise to them. Uh, do you find any resistance from those companies uh, to deal with the retail investor? There are some companies who openly say, we don't really want retail investors. Uh, you know, they're a bit of a pain. Uh, you know, they will, there's, it costs us money to have them on the register. We've got to pay the registrar more for all of that. And, you know, they won't make any difference. We're not going to be able to raise a lot of money. Um, yeah, so, so there, are some, there are some companies like that. I think it's a rather short-sighted attitude because as I've explained, they're pretty important to the generation of liquidity. You know, if, if you want to engage with, um, with institutions and they've got a liquidity filter, you know, you might fill every criteria that the, fulfill every criteria that the institution wants to buy your shares, but now if you fail the liquidity test, it doesn't make any difference. You're, you, you know, they're not going to buy you. And so they, are, they can't, the institution can't themselves overcome the liquidity test They've set themselves, somebody else has got to do it for them. Well, it's you guys. Oh, we've got a question here. Just one question on liquidity. So mm. you mentioned about the average trade size. Does that take into account dark pools used by financial institutions? No, uh, the data I've used for that is um, simply the LSE reporting data and the NEX data. And how do you think dark pools affect in terms of okay, so, so it varies depending... Is it just quickly saying what a dark pool Sorry, is? A, yeah. a dark pool is another way of trading directly between institutions that doesn't touch the market. So we used to have a system where every trade had to be reported on the market. Uh, it was mandatory. Um, but that's one of the things that changed with uh, Big Bang as well. Um, so dark pools are important uh, in, at the bigger end of the market, in FTSE. As you come down, they're not really very important at all. Okay. And thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause to all three of our speakers. <laughs>